All right, folks, All right, once folks. again, on Casey Green, we're here at the ASU GSV Innovation Conference in San Diego. Joining me for our next conversation is Mark Schneider, who's Vice President and Senior Fellow at AIR, the American Associ Institute for Research. Is that, is that actually what the acronym stands for? Is that's, that right? that's, that's correct. That's right. Mark, you were also in a prior life. Uh, you were the, the top data guy in the education uh, for education for the federal government, the National Center for Education Statistics. That's great. All right. So I want to, our conversation to talk about a couple of things. One, I want to talk about the kind of the, the data issues in education, mm -hmm. both K-12 and higher ed, both in terms of the repository and the archiving, but also the conversation about big data in education. Okay. And then second, I want to move on to a conversation, in part what brings you here to the conference, to talk about alternative versions of college rankings, which are largely dominated now by a couple of hundred elite institutions in U.S. News and World, World Report, Correct. and and you know how useful those things are, and, and for many how useful they are not. Okay. Okay. Um, certainly, it, but it, it's sort of the the gauntlet thrown at the feet of both, it, sort of, of many institutions, and I do know, as I suspect you do as well, there are people, administrators on campus of uh, college. When you ask them what they do, the job title may say one thing on their business card, and you know what they really are is they're the assistant dean or the associate dean for the U.S. News rankings, either for an academic program or for the university. Which means all too often they lie. <laughs> you can say that. I'm, no, I'm, just, I'm just right. queuing you up, but that's right, fine. Right, right. So, so let's talk about what the federal government does. You know, in, in one sense, there's a long history. Cost, the Constitution dictates the census that we, we are a data collecting people. The government amasses a huge amount of data about education, a lot in terms of earned degrees and, and uh, school certificates and the people that work in K-12 and higher ed. What does the government do well with data? What does it need to do better in terms of the role of NCES? So NCES is the oldest federal statistical agency in the, in the nation. It was started in 1867. Um, and it's been collecting data for a long time. It actually obviously predated the, um, uh, the Department of Education by well over 100 years. Uh, it's an independent statistical agency, uh, which means it's, it's driven by the data rather than by policy. And actually, there are strong firewalls between the policy side of the department and the statistical side. Um, part of the problem is it is a federal statistical agency. And the emphasis there is on federal, which means that it often lags the, the current situation. Um, so in higher education, for example, it runs something called IPEDS, the Integrated Post-Secondary Education Data System. And the, the data is two years old at its earliest. And it mismeasures many things. It's very expensive to run. It requires lots of input from the, uh, from the institutions and uh, many things that it collects are not useful at all. Well, the, I'm an iPad user. I've been for all my career. So for example, the research I used to do when I was with UCLA's Higher Education Research Institute, mm -hmm. we would take iPads data about earned degrees as a way of talking about proportion, uh, the, the numbers, sort of the character of the campus in terms of engineering degrees versus education degrees. Um, the iPads financial data is very important in terms of looking at financial resources. On the other hand, to your point, uh, the lot of the conversation that we've been having publicly you know, before the Spellings Commission, certainly afterwards, about accountability and institutional outcomes, right. the iPads data isn't all that useful. That's being polite. It doesn't do much in terms of technology, either in K-12 or higher ed. Um, it is, in one sense, a legacy system that's playing catch up. Um, and it, very hard for legacy systems to change in terms of some new needs and new requirements. Correct. And um, so it's a lagging system. It, it worked to some extent in when it was created, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, um, when students started in September of one year and most of them graduated in May four years later, mm -hmm. right? And you had mostly full-time students on a, on a four-year trajectory. Um, as the demographics of society have changed, changed and as students now do different kinds of things, transfers a lot, you know, the, the iPad system does not capture any of that. It took a long time for iPads to capture, for example, online enrollments. Online enrollments. We, you know, we, a student we, was a student as opposed to what kind of student necessarily for their educational experience. Correct. So, so iPads is not reflective of the current situation. It does a terrible job, for example, on um, transfer students, which uh, uh, penalizes community colleges drastically. Uh, for example, another example, it doesn't count a lot of the kinds of activities that schools are engaged in at the current time. 
uh, they're huge. So I want to make a distinction between certificates, which are granted by schools, which are measured, they're counted, but certifications are not are, are not in the system. Uh, and the, increasingly, schools are doing certifications. These are things like Microsoft certification or Sigma certifications, where you end up with an industry recognized uh, certificate but some of it's not for credit, some of it is for credit. It's a mess out there and, and the federal government does a terrible job capturing the mix, the total mix of activities in schools at the, at the current time. Yeah. I, I want to come back to your comment about community colleges. I think that also applies to a lot of state institutions as well. Correct. Um, in the sense that there are other parts of the research agenda of the federal government that begin to look at cohorts and the experience of cohorts in higher education of students who may start at one institution. So we may get better national data about what percentage of students actually earn degrees, but the conversations often in state legislatures and elsewhere about what percentage of students who started an institution complete may not reflect the fact that many students may migrate for lots of different reasons. Uh, not a good mix on program, issues about cost, other kinds of the experience they had at one place. I, I think of family members uh, and friends who made, are college graduates, but they didn't graduate necessarily from the place they started. So that, that's held potentially against the institution where they started, even though, and, and a credit, and not necessarily a credit for the place where they completed. A absolutely. And, and this is one of the more fundamental, maybe the most fundamental problem with iPads. Mm -hmm. um, there are other things. It's, a, again, a large system that goes back as a legacy system. Uh, it, it, and NCS is not capable, it does not have the legislative authority to change most of its collections because it's mandated by Congress. No. So I've had many discussions with people, and they, uh, especially when I was commissioner, they would say, well, why don't you just stop doing that? You know, nobody uses it. And we have empirical evidence, we've captured empirical evidence about how often things are used in iPads. So most of the items in iPads are never used. And we can't stop using them because yeah. they're legislatively mandated. And yet, so much, uh, at least, you know, many people feel that you know, what, whatever the data collection is, might be and the intent of that data collection, a lot of that doesn't, the, that data and the insight from the data don't necessarily reflect in terms of the conversations, the pronouncements of folks in Congress in terms of what they say about education, K-12 and higher. Correct. The other, I mean, so the... It's supposed to be a resource and it, often it's not one that's properly leveraged. Correct. And and we could say that for the, the what, what are we up to, about $750 million of investment in state longitudinal data systems uh, that were supposed to build data. So one of the biggest complaints I have about this huge program which paid states to take uh, student level data and track them uh, over time was that the... Um, that there were no use requirements until the until almost all the money was spent. So the federal government told people, told states to, and I signed like six hundred million dollars of that um, to create data warehouses, which was the absolute, the absolute wrong idea. Uh, we should have been creating data retail centers rather than data warehouses. Um, and so a lot of this money created these state longitudinal data systems, which are slowly, on, but only slowly, being used. Uh, to reflect the huge investment of money that that went into that. I want to shift a little bit. You know, I know you're here in, uh, in large part to have for a con public conversation about alternatives to college ranking systems. Uh, the most prominent, that's known to many, is U.S. News and World Report. But there are a lot of different groups that are involved in rankings. The Wall Street Journal used to do business schools. Um, other group, uh, the federal government at one point, indirectly through some of the agencies, were doing some things about graduate education uh, ranking programs. A lot of that is since dissipated. What should we be looking at in these conversations? Because so much of it, as is publicly recognized, is driven by inputs. Student SAT scores, uh, the impressionistic uh, responses of college presidents to peer institutions and Correct. other kinds of things. Correct. Talk with us a little bit about, about where we need to do better, So, and, I, and both in terms of, of the data we collect, but also the user education about those resources. So the, 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 the thing about uh, user education is a really difficult one, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. So I'm involved in two different projects that that are seeking alternative ways of rank, ranking colleges. So I work with Money Magazine, which has uh, the Money College Planner, and we are very intentional in that system to put much, much more emphasis on outcomes, uh, like wage outcomes, for example, than inputs. Um, we also, and this is a very tricky question, 
you also have to do the equivalent of value added or risk adjusted metrics, right? So Harvard graduates 97%, its graduation rate is 97, 98%, depending on what the year is. My only question is like, what happened to the other 2%, right? Um, but other schools are graduating 60%, but in part because the hand that they're dealt, the students that they're educating are much harder to educate than are the, you know, than the students that Harvard, uh, that Harvard has. So one of the things that we do in the Money Magazine uh, ranking is to do value added. Um, so we regress wages, for example, against a whole bunch of other indicators and then look at which schools are beating the odds given the hand that they were dealt in terms of student demographics. So this is a large issue about how to do risk adjusted metrics. We tried to do this in, the, in government when I was at NCS and all you end up doing is like fighting with people over the issue of, well, you're a government agency, you, you chose this, you chose that, why, 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 why? And the nice thing about the Money Magazine, it's a, it's a private enterprise, it's a magazine. They make editorial decisions about what variables should be in, the weights, and if you don't like their ratings, don't buy the magazine. But you're still dependent, are you not, upon data that comes from the institution? I'm, I'm mindful of the days I spent during my graduate career at the Public Affairs Library at UCLA, where I used to work with printed versions of the, uh, at that point it was called Hegis, you know, before stuff was available easily online. Right. A little quip of its, above the stacks that said, governments amass in, uh, statistics, they pour them into computers, but at the end of the day, it's the night watchman who puts down what he damn well pleases. Coming back to your comment about the deans who have, you know, operationally are the responsible for Business Week or other rankings. Right. The, the validity and the veracity of the data, whether it's Money Magazine or U.S. News? So, I mean, that's a serious issue. We use, uh, so for wages, we use pay scale data, which is self-reported, but it's been validated several, uh, in several as, ways. As opposed to the numbers from the alumni office? Yeah, well, the alumni, so any, any data about wages, and I'll, I'll talk about the other, yeah. excuse me, the other system that I'm involved in. Um, so any system that relies on alumni reports of wages is extremely biased. It's small sample sizes. The people who answer are usually people who are successful that you could track down. Uh, so we, we will not use any kind of survey data, uh, at least alumni survey data. So Payscale is, is, has uh, three or four million respondents in it. They validate it. They ran it against, for example, the wage data that, that the department released uh, um, as part of the scorecard. Um, to the extent possible, we use administrative data uh, in, in, in this. And it, you're, you're correct. I mean, ultimately, iPads is someone sits down and fills it out. So there could be, and we, know, we do know that there, that schools do, um, you know, they do fudge some numbers in iPads, but much less so than in uh, involuntary uh, systems. Uh, the, other, the other thing that we're doing now is um, my company called College Measures, which is owned by uh, AR actually, um, works with states. And what we do is we track students from every public institution and many private institutions into the labor market and we find out how much money they're earning using unemployment insurance wage data one, three, five, eight, ten years out. Then what we do is we calculate how much it costs to have achieved that degree in terms of time to degree, uh, net price and things like that and then we now create ROI calculations. What about the differential by field? The fact that engineers, you know, invariably at starting salaries and over over time, for example, will make much more than educators supposed to go to K twelve education, and they come from the same institution. Right, and and so the lesson that we have for the ROI work that we've been doing is that there's much much more internal variation across field of study than there is across institutions. Mm -hmm. And what about the ebb and flow of the economic cycle? I mean, for example. Petroleum uh, engineers in Texas, like two years example, ago. Right. Two, two years ago, they were making one hundred sixty thousand dollars, and now they're many of them are making nothing. And, and the temporal dimension. I mean, depending on when you enter the labor market, if you look at starting salaries for recent graduates who entered the labor market during any of the downturns, I entered the labor market in nineteen sixty three, which is a crappy market. College graduates in two thousand eight entered the labor market in a crappy market. But on the other hand, if, if you graduated from college with a in nineteen ninety eight. When everything was booming, right. you know, those, those differentials in terms of the economic cycles also play out in some of this. Right, and there's no question yeah. about it. So measuring the measuring wage outcomes is is as tricky as measuring anything else, right? Uh, and the consequences can of getting it wrong can be uh, can be serious. Is it better to do a ten year out as opposed to a one year out? Or a well, one, out? the problem with one year out is that uh, especially for liberal arts graduates, it takes some time for them to get launched. Right. But the fact of the matter is. 
the even if you start with with a low paying job with a degree that doesn't pay much liberal arts uh, uh, psychology um, music anthropology uh, anthropology governor of florida wanted to get rid of the program ten, right. 10 years later 10 years later you're making more money but you're still at the bottom of the heap and the 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 message that we're trying mm -hmm. to do in this roi work is that there are short-term certificates and short-term associate degrees, all of them in technical fields or health fields, that actually end putting you up in the in, putting you in the middle class, and often make more money than liberal arts graduates. Let's come back to the user education part, because that would seem to be critical. You know, you walk past the newsstand, um, colleges in, in an airport or a train station, or anyplace else, colleges and universities sort of slice and dice to their own versions. Um, it may or may not be true, but I think I remember seeing a sticker on top of a U.S. news thing from a local college saying, we are the best in four voting precincts, kind of. That's slicing and dicing for yep, competitive yep. advantage. Mm -hmm. What do we have to do about the user education? The Department of Education has been trying to do this under the Obama administration. We're seeing some other initiatives and other efforts. What are the two or three most important initiatives to undertake in terms of just not just the better information, but better user education to understand these questions as families and individuals invest in them. Right. So we're, so we're working in several states, and, and the state of Tennessee mm -hmm. is probably our best partner in terms of trying to explore the, these multiple outcomes and the multiple outlets. Um, we're working with Texas also and uh, Colorado, uh, and it's the same problem. Everybody knows we have the data, the data rock solid, as solid as we can get. But nobody's quite sure how to get it into the hands of students at the critical time. So we're trying to uh, develop applications that counselors could use that show up on iPhones, all the all the normal stuff. And um, you know, we over the five years, six years, we've been working harder and harder to figure out how to communicate directly with students. We're now working on curricular material that could go into, for example, uh, financial literacy courses. Great. Mark Schneider from AIR, thanks very much for joining us. It's been a really interesting conversation about some really difficult issues for higher ed. Much appreciated. Okay, we're going to take a short break. And next up, Matthew Patinsky, who's the CEO of Parchment. Stay with us. We'll be right back, folks. Great.